<clears throat> Thank you, Jonathan. It's wonderful to be back working, conspiring with you on this question. Jonathan came to the center as a fellow and uh, failed the first year, so we had to keep him for a second year. Um, uh, but I think he's learned a lot, it seems. And, um, <laughs> And I'm eager to participate in a conference which he's hosting for the next two days focused on this question of institutional corruption in the context of um, um, the nutrition uh, and food industries. So I want you to focus with me for a second on this device and the idea behind this technology. It suggests to us many organizing, framing notions, true north. An idea that a device can always find the direction we should be going. And then I want you to think a little bit about maybe when you were three or five or ten and you had a device like this and you found another device like that. And then you put that device together with the first. And what you saw was something like this. You saw that this device intended to point in true north was now pointing in a weirdly different way. It was suffering what people who study these devices call magnetic deviation. Now, a lot of people find this really, really cool. I found this video on the internet of a guy who finds it extremely cool. Here's his video. Part two, all right. I'm on top of this peak near Gore Canyon. Now watch this compass. Oh, man. Oh, man, indeed. That's exactly the idea I want you to feel. I want you to feel the idea of, oh, man, when you recognize the way in which true north can deviate, the way in which an influence can enter into an economy of forces and drive something from where it's supposed to point into a different direction. Deviation. Or we could call it a corruption. A corruption of the purpose of this device. And if we predicate that idea of corruption of an institution, we can see the way in which this idea describes the way an institution can be steered away from its intended aim. And that's the sense in which I mean the term institutional corruption. Now, the steering in institutional corruption is not necessarily criminal. It's, it's just an innocent magnet, right? There's nothing criminal about that influence. It's not bribery I'm talking about. It's not any violation of any existing rule. Instead, what it is is a certain kind of influence within an economy of influence that has a particular effect. It's institutional corruption in the sense I want to describe it if it wrongly weakens the effectiveness of an institution, especially if it does that by weakening necessary public trust of that institution. In that sense, it's institutional corruption. Okay, let's start with a paradigm case of institutional corruption, one that no one will question when I suggest it to you tonight this institution. <laughs> now, this institution has a certain rap. The rap that many people have is that it is fundamentally corrupt. But the sense in which many people believe it's corrupt is a kind of Rob Blagojevich sense of corruption. Or he actually never made it there. He didn't get to buy his Senate seat. So think about Randy Duke Cunningham or William Jefferson. Criminals is the sense many people have about that institution. The place where Money in brown paper bags gets secreted among different members engaging in a kind of quid pro quo bribery. That sense leads 46% of Americans to believe that institution is in that sense corrupt. But in my view, that sense of corruption is just wrong as a description of the institution of Congress. Congress is not filled with the likes of Rob Blagojevich's. This institution, as my colleague Dennis Thompson puts it, is now has an integrity and competence as high as it's ever been. So that if it's important... Because people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. If it's important to know whether the president's a crook, let me tell you the Congress also is not a crook in 
well, a little bit more accurate sense than that president wasn't a cook. <laughs> but there is a sense, I want to suggest, of corruption that does properly predicate of this institution, a sense that's true when you talk about that institution. A corruption not necessarily of the people inside the institution, a corruption of the institution itself. Again, an instance of institutional corruption. And we can see that sense if we think back to the way the framers of our Constitution described that they were giving us when they gave us the Constitution. They called our government a republic. But by a republic, they meant a representative democracy. And by a representative democracy, as Federalist 52 puts it, they meant a government that would have a branch dependent upon the people alone. So here's their model of government. We have the people, and we have the government. I do my own slides. It's cool the way that bounces like that, right? So the people and the government, this marionette-like relationship that establishes the proper dependency that defines what our republic is supposed to be. But here's the problem. Our Congress has evolved a different dependence. It's not just a dependence upon the people. It's increasingly it's a dependence upon the funders. Members of Congress spend between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get back to Congress or to get their party back into power. And like any of us, as they do that, they develop a sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do might affect their ability to raise money. In the words of the X-Files, they become shapeshifters as they constantly adjust themselves in light of what they know will make it possible to raise money. Not on issues 1 to 10, but on issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. Then to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> now the point is, this is a dependence too. But it's a different and conflicting dependence from a dependence upon the people alone because, surprise, surprise, the funders are not the people. 0.26%. I know you're thinking I'm a lawyer. I don't know how to do percentages. But I really do mean 0.26%. One quarter of 1% of Americans give more than $200 in a congressional election. 0.05% give the maximum amount to any congressional candidate. 0.01%, the 1% of the 1%, give more than $10,000 in an election cycle. And my favorite recent statistic, 0.000063% have given 80% of the money that super PACs have spent in this election cycle so far. 196 Americans have given 80% of the money that super PACs have spent so far. So the Occupy Wall Street people are so proud of their slogan, we're the 99%, bad marketing, right? <laughs> we're the 99.74% to the 99.95% to the 99.99% to the 99.999937%, depending on which number you want to point, the number percentage of Americans who don't have the influence that the tiniest slice of the 1% have because they fund the elections. Now, the Supreme Court doesn't get this yet, but they will. This is corruption. It's not brown paper bag corruption. It's not Rob Lagojevich corruption. It's corruption relative to the framer's baseline. It's a corruption relative to this idea of a government dependent upon the people alone, because they're dependent as well, and maybe primarily, upon their funders. It is, in this sense, dependence corruption. Now, this corruption has an effect. It first wrongfully weakens the effectiveness of this institution, and two, it weakens it by weakening the necessary public trust of this institution. And it does this in three ways. Number one, this pattern leads Americans to believe, and I think Americans are right to believe, but Americans believe money buys results in Congress, quote unquote. In a poll I conducted or commissioned for the book that I published last fall, we found that 75% of Americans believe money buys results in Congress. 
a little bit more Democrats than Republicans, but I guarantee you before the Republicans took control of the House, it was just as many Republicans as Democrats. So whether it's two-thirds or three-fourths, here's the one thing we all agree about. Money buys results in Congress, which leads to number two. That belief erodes trust in this institution. So two years ago, Gallup found that 11% of Americans have confidence in Congress. Last year, they said that went up. It's 12%, they said. But then the New York Times reported it's only 9% of Americans who have confidence in Congress. 9%. We should put that in context, right? There certainly were more Americans who believed in the British crown at the time of the revolution than who believe in this Congress today. <laughs> And that leads to point number three. This low trust erodes participation in this democracy. Rock the Vote, an organization that registers and turns out young voters and turned out the largest number of young voters ever in the history of an election in 2008, and I think certainly, therefore, delivered the election for Barack Obama, found in 2010 a significant number of their voters were not going to turn out and vote, so they polled them. And the number one reason given by far, two to one over the second highest reason, was, quote, no matter who wins, corporate interests will still have too much power and prevent real change. So why waste my time? And it's not just kids. The vast majority of Americans who could have voted in 2010 did not vote, in part at least because of this belief. Now, these reasons, I think, suffice to show why I think this institution is a paradigm of institution, institutional corruption. It's easiest with this story to see this pattern. It doesn't follow then that it's easy to solve this pattern. Indeed, I think the darkest moment in my thinking of this problem was when I met with this man, Jim Cooper, who's a Democrat from Virginia. Uh, I'm from Tennessee. He's been in Congress for as long as all but about 20 other members of Congress. And he said, the problem with Congress is that Capitol Hill has increasingly become a kind of farm league for K Street. Members and staffers and bureaucrats have an increasingly common business model, a business model focused on their life after government, their life as a lobbyist. 50% of members of the Senate left the Senate between 1998 and 2004 to become lobbyists, 42% of the members of the House. Everyone in this system depends upon this system surviving because if the system survives, they get an extraordinary boost in wealth when they move off Capitol Hill to K Street. A recent calculation estimated the average increase in salary for members of Congress was 1,542% when they left to become lobbyists. So how could they, who depend upon this system, ever be expected to change this system? And when you answer that question in the obvious way, you see why it's not clear how we could ever get out of this kind of institutional corruption, even though it's clear why this is institutional corruption. So it's easy to see not easy to solve, but clarifying to see, because I think once you see that pattern, we can begin to see that pattern elsewhere. So what are the other examples we might think of as institutional corruption? There are plenty alleged, and I want to map out the allegations. I don't want to make any claims as strong as I've made about Congress. Let's think first about the profession of medicine, or more precisely about pharmaceuticals. 2005, the amount spent on ph pharmaceutical drugs was about $200 billion in the United States. 2008, about $20 billion was spent to market those pharmaceuticals. And of the $20 billion, about $12 billion was spent on what's called detailing. Now, detailing is the pro practice of giving samples or gifts to doctors or members of hospitals for the purpose of inducing them to consider and hopefully to prescribe the drugs that are being pushed here. As one detailer described it, the essence of pharmaceutical gifting is, quote, bribes that aren't considered bribes. 
And then as he went on, while it's the doctor's job to treat patients and not to justify their actions, it's my job to constantly sway the doctors. It's a job I'm paid and trained to do. Doctors are neither trained nor paid to negotiate. Most of the time, they don't even realize that's what they're doing. Now, in the context of this question, there's a whole series of complex claims, but the particular claim or question that institutional corruption study ask is, does this influence, this detailing practice, either change the prescribing behavior of doctors or change trust in prescribing advice? That's how we think about it in the context of medicine. Think about it in the context of government agencies. Regulators, of course, are in the business of applying rules to facts. And that raises the question, how do they find the facts that they apply their rules to? One of the regulators that does this is the Supreme Court. A very interesting case decided in, in 2008, the Supreme Court described the limits it would impose on the fact-finding it would engage in. In this case, which decided the question whether punitive damages could be given in the context of admiralty cases, the Supreme Court limited those punitive damages, but then dropped a footnote in their opinion that says following, the court is aware of a body of literature running parallel to anecdotal reports examining the predictability of punitive awards by confronting, conducting numerous mock juries where different jurors are confronted with the same hypothetical case. But because this research was funded in part by Exxon, we decline to rely upon it. So the principle here is it's funded in part by a party interested in the results. And because it was funded by that party, we exclude it from the consideration we will make in this case. Now, you could look at that decision. You could say it's pretty admirable. But you could also look at that decision and say it's a little bit precious. Because when you think about the other regulators that have to apply rules to facts, in particular agencies in the executive branch, agencies rely upon studies funded in part by the industry regulated all the time. So here's my favorite example about the uh, chemical chromium-6. Chromium-6, which is hexavalent chromium oxide used in the uh, many factory contexts um, uh, for many years until recently. When workers in these factories exposed to chromium-6 would welcome new workers to their floor, they would sometimes practice what was called the dime trick. The dime trick was an older worker, a worker who had been around the floor for a while, would take a dime and pass it from one side of his nose to the other through the hole in the septum that had developed in his nose. Now, that began to suggest to some people there was something dangerous about this chemical. <laughs> And it got OSHA into the mix. And OSHA, in 1976, said it has concluded that a comprehensive occupational health standard is urgently needed to protect employees. And in 1976, they promised to complete it in the shortest possible time, 1976. The regulation of chromium-6 was issued in 2006. A 30-year delay, a delay caused in part by studies funded in part by the industries regulated because those industries said there's nothing dangerous about this chemical, there's no problem with this chemical, you should not be regulating this chemical. And 30 years later, we finally got around to regulating the chemical. Now the question institutional corruption studies ask is does this influence of these kinds of inputs into the fact-finding process, these studies funded in part by the industries regulated, change the fact-finding process or separately, does it change trust in the fact-finding process? Or think of the context of journalism. This is a fantastic book by Robert Ch McChesney and John Nichols describing the collapse of journalism, which most people attribute to the consequences of the internet or the consequences of Craig Newmark, the founder of Craigslist. And as they suggest in this book, the effect of Craig and the internet is real, but the real decline in journalism in America happens long before the internet. As they suggest, the big change comes in the late 1970s and 1980s when large corporate chains accelerated the long-term trend to gobble, gobble up daily newspapers. So the claim here is the change is tied 
to the structure of ownership. Once these newspapers, typically family-owned, get bought by these corporate chains that are publicly traded companies, the force of the influence of those publicly traded companies radically changed the way journalism functioned. As David Simon puts it, when locally based family owned newspapers were consolidated into publicly owned newspaper chains, an essential trust between journalism and the community served was betrayed. So the claim is a type of ownership corrupted the institution. So this perspective asks, does that influence, the influence of publicly traded companies, change journalism or at least change the trust in the journalism that it produces? For one more example here, think about rating agencies in the context of Wall Street. Of course, 2008 saw Wall Street collapse, and when Wall Street went off the cliff, it pulled the rest of us over the cliff as well. One increasingly studied component of that collapse was the role played by rating agencies. Rating agencies that were in the business of saying whether the bonds and the derivatives, which eventually turned out to be worth nothing, were highly valued, properly highly valued, or more importantly, low risk. These agencies consistently gave AAA ratings to bonds that turned out to be worth junk. And the fundamental question is, what led them to be so systematically mistaken? Well, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission looked at this issue and they said, we conclude the failures of credit rating agencies were essential cogs in the wheel of financial destruction. And one reason they failed was that rating agencies, just before the period leading up to this collapse, adopted a brand new business model for funding their work. Instead of being paid by someone independent of the bonds they were rating to rate the bonds, they were increasingly paid by the very people whose bonds they were rating. They would go to Goldman Sachs and say to Goldman Sachs, we'll rate your bonds if you pay us. And Goldman Sachs would say, OK, we want a AAA rating. And they say, well, I'm not sure we can give you a AAA. And Goldman Sachs would say, we'll go to someone else. So as the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission concluded, because issuers could choose which rating agencies to do business with, and because the agencies depended on the issuers for their revenues, rating agencies felt pressure to give favorable ratings so that they might remain competitive. As Simon Johnson and James Quack conclude in this book, Wall Street said, hey, if you don't give me the rating I want, the guy across the street will, and we'll get them all the business. And they just played the rating agencies off one another, or a little bit more colorfully in this wonderful book by Roger Lowenstein, Imagine the big rating agencies as three competitive saloons standing side by side with each free to set its own drinking ages. Before long, nine-year-olds would be downing bourbon. It's an obvious dynamic created by a structure of competition. And so institutional corruption studies ask, does this competition among these private regulators change the quality of the ratings or change trust in these ratings? OK, and then one final really hard example. Think in the context of food. Now, there are many possible things we could talk about in the question of influence properly exercised in the context of food. But I want to take a perspective that's suggested by this really powerful book by Richard Manning, Against the Grain, which is his focus on agriculture. And as he puts it a little bit over the top, how agriculture has hijacked civilization. As Manning puts in his book, it sounds odd to say, but agriculture is not about raising food. It's not about feeding people. The goal of agriculture is, to, is the accumulation of wealth. What agriculture grows is not food, but commodities, grain not to eat, but to store, trade, and to process. And then he asks, so what would we call a system with the clear goal not of accumulating wealth, but of the earth-shakingly radical idea of attending to human nutrition, health, and well-being. Well, he says, for openers, it would not deal with commodities. It would deal with the staggeringly long list of familiar fruits and vegetables, but also grains and pulses and the unfamiliar regional crops that agriculture orphaned and forgot. Food, in this sense, are those crops people grow to eat directly, or to put it differently, he says, to say that everything without a corporate logo in a supermarket on it may be an oversimplification of what food is, 
but, uh, but not by much. Okay, so what he's saying here is that there's a certain economy now of food that he would like to encourage that would be focused on the radical idea of attending to human nutrition, health, and well-being. But instead, what we get is an industry whose focus is not quite in that direction, but instead in the direction of promoting extraordinary profits by an extremely profitable industry. So what explains that deviation? Well, some people look at it and say, well, it's just the product of the free market. And the response to that naive claim is that there's no free in that market. Take one of the biggest beneficiaries of this non-free market, ADM. ADM's president, Dwayne Andreas, in a series of interviews, has basically said the same thing. This is what he says. There isn't one grain of anything in the world that is sold in a free market, not one. The only place you see a free market is in the speeches of politicians. People who are not in the Midwest do not understand that this is a socialist country, a socialist country because companies like his receive enormous subsidies from the government to produce the products they produce. These endless subsidy for certain kinds of, quote, few foods, subsidies which make Duane rich, for example, subsidies that support the ethanol industry, as has been calculated, for every dollar of profit that ADM gets from ethanol, it costs taxpayers $11 in subsidies. So these subsidies, Manning and others, of course, conclude, change agriculture and they change culture more generally. As Manning puts in his book, the product is a social system that by any reasonable measure, is by any measurable measure dysfunctional. Small town life in the American Midwest has become untenable, and despite its stated reasons for being, to diversify agriculture and to keep farmers on the farm, the Department of Agriculture has, since its founding in the 19th century, produced two unbroken curves in the opposite direction. Now, my concern in this story is the consequences of all this for what we eat. Because when you change incentives, you change behavior. That's what the economists tell us. So, for example, there's a pretty good consensus among people who study the matter that we eat too much of this stuff, not enough of this stuff. We're not actually this stuff. It's instead high fructose corn syrup that we eat too much of. In your supermarket, 40% of the products now have high fructose corn syrup in it. In 1980, none of the products had high fructose corn syrup in it. So what explains that change? Well, one reason is sugar is expensive relative to corn. And that, again, invites the market aficionados to say it's, therefore, the command of the market. But again, not quite so easily is that the claim of the market. Sugar in America is expensive because tariffs protect the domestic sugar industry, giving them about a billion dollars of extra profit every year, costing the American economy about three billion dollars because sugar in America is two to three times the price of sugar in other comparable countries around the world. And corn in America is so cheap because it's subsidized by our government. Seventy-four billion dollars in the last 15 years leading some economists to say that the cost of producing corn is actually negative. So when you take these two things and add them together, the subsidized corn and the protected sugar, you begin to understand the radical shift in the cost of foods. So between the period 1997 and 2003, the cost of vegetables goes up by 17%. Cost of a Big Mac goes down by 5.4%. Cost of a bottle of Coke, down by 35%. And as you see those two winners here and what they're typically associated with, it won't surprise you that if you compare the size of the fast food market in 1970 to 2000, we go from a $6 billion fast food market to a $100 billion fast food market in 2000. So in 2003, people who were really animated by the idea that we eat too much sugar decided to try to act on this consensus. The World Health Organization tried to promulgate a standard that said, no more than 10% of your daily caloric intake should come from added sugars. Well, the sugar industry, they have this very sweet little logo here, um, they went ballistic. There they are, ballistic about that particular recommendation. They got the Senate 
to threaten to withdraw funding from the WHO if the WHO didn't back down from their crazy suggestion of 10%. What they wanted the WHO to do is to adopt the standard that 25% of your daily caloric intake might come from added sugar. Well, the WHO didn't back down, but our government did. 2003, the Food Nutrition Board adopted standards that allow 25% of your daily caloric intake to come from sugar. A balanced diet, according to our government, could look something like this. Start the morning with Fruit Loops and M&M in a glass of milk. Then for lunch, you can have a cheeseburger. For dinner, you can have pizza, pepperoni pizza, three slices of pepperoni pizza. And of course, don't forget the sugar cookies for dessert. That is a balanced diet, according to our government. Now, institutional corruption studies ask, is this change in nutrition here caused by the influences I've described? Or do these influences at least change the trust in the practice of nutrition that we now practice as a people. And this is where it gets difficult, because I actually think that it doesn't affect the trust we have in the food we practice and the food we eat. It doesn't weaken the trust. And this is, in some sense, the most depressing part of this story of institutional corruption, because there are some cases where we as a people have the right kind of perspective. It's not hard for us to look at Congress and believe that system is corrupt. It's not hard for us to wonder maybe the way we deal with drugs is not properly influenced. It's not difficult for us to recognize the ways in which these rating agencies might be following the money rather than following the truth. We all can begin to worry about the way in which journalism seems to have been undermined by the way we've allowed the market and journalism to change. Solving those problems is not easy but solving is understandable. We have a sense of what the right answer would be, and we'd support moves towards the right answer. Food is different. If we are what we eat, then I think we believe in what we are. And the questions here are really about whether we even have the capacity as a people anymore to recognize just how crazy our practices have become. Indeed, it's kind of crazy to try to convince people that the way all of us eat, or most of us eat, has any problem attached to it at all. And I think we can begin to see why it's a little bit crazy in the normalcy we see in our society around practices that any objective person has got to say is just insane. So I submit the following story. My second grader has a school nutrition program very progressive public schools in Brookline, Massachusetts, among the best public schools in the nation. They have a nutrition program where they try to teach the kids what healthy eating is. And the program's broken up into segments. After each segment, the kids are rewarded with candy. <laughs> you know, this is like an AA club <laughs> that after each meeting goes out for a drink. And when my wife raised the question to the teacher that there seemed to be some discontinuity between the message and the practice, she had no understanding. She had no clue what my wife was talking about. This makes the kids happy, she said. And my wife asked, well, are we teaching them to be happy by e eating candy? Or are we teaching them what is nutritious food? Now, of course, if we look at our history, it's certainly the case crazy has been right before, right? There was a time when fighting smoking was crazy. <laughs> there was a time when separate but equal was obvious. Anyone who questioned it was crazy. So crazy has been flipped in the past. But the hard fact to confront for those of us who think that our current practices now are crazy is that it's a very long road to get from where we are to the world where crazy has been flipped. OK, so how do we get there in any of these contexts? How do we get to the world where we can flip crazy? How do we end or at least resist the kind of deviations that institutional corruption presents? Now, my view is that there are some cases that are just simple. Simple, at least conceptually simple. 
In some cases, the only thing we have to do to solve this problem is just to take away the magnet. Take away the magnet, and we have an institution that falls back towards the direction it needs to follow. So again, I think thinking in the context of Congress, it's a relatively, conceptually, relatively simple problem. If the systemic problem here is that the funders are not the people, the systemic solution is to make the funders the people. To give them away, I know that looks like give Congress away, and most people would want to give Congress away if we could only do that, but I don't mean that. I mean give Congress a way to fund their elections without Faust, right? Without selling their souls and thereby alienating most of America because America believes they have sold their souls. Yes, please. There's a crazy person back here. Thank you for the crazies. Here's to the crazy ones, Apple would have said. Okay, but the one way to do this, and I increasingly think the only way to do this, is for us to openly and strongly, and all of us, because our politicians will never say this, but all of us say, we need citizen-funded campaigns. All right, now people look at that and say, well, what could that mean, citizen-funded campaigns? I gotta take a couple steps to make it perfectly clear what I mean here. First step we've gotta take is, campaigns have gotta be funded. I know internet gurus like to pretend we're moving to the world where campaigns can be free, because it all can be free on the internet. We're way, way, way away from that world. So we gotta fund campaigns. That begs the question though, by whom are campaigns going to be funded? So we could say, should they be funded by citizens or by non-citizens? Should they be funded by the Chinese or the French? Or whatever, whether or not corporations are persons, nobody has ever said a corporation is a, is a citizen. So should they be funded by citizens or non-citizens? I think this first question is a pretty simple one to answer. Most people would say they should be funded by citizens. So in one sense, that's what I mean by citizen-funded campaigns. But that begs a second question. How could citizens fund their campaigns? Because you can look at the current system we have, a system of private funding of campaigns, and you can say, that's citizen-funded elections. The money to fund these elections comes mainly from citizens. A bunch of questions about the super PACs, and of course, super PAC money coming from corporations is not money coming from citizens. But if we even if we eliminate that, and we just had privately funded campaigns, it would be citizens making those contributions. This is a system, though, that has evolved into large dollar-funded campaigns funded, as I said, by the smallest percentage of Americans, 0 0.26, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, producing this radically unequal influence inside of our election system. Indeed, as many people say, we should recognize that we actually have two elections in America. We have the voter election, where we each get to vote, and we have the money election where we each get to give contributions to candidates so that they will take positions that we want or support the candidates who take the positions we want so that they win in the voting election. Now the weird thing about the American government is that our constitution requires that in the voting election we be all almost exactly equal in the influence we have. Supreme Court has said that if a certain state or a certain district in a state has more voting power than another district, you've got to redraw the boundaries to make sure that the power of each voter is effectively the same, down to like 0.1%. But in the money election, the influence of voters is radically different. There's still people here. They're just really tiny, I promise. <laughs> that if you added up all of these different income groups, these are 0 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, 80 to 95, 95 to 99, and then top 1%, if you just took the 1% versus the 99%, in the last election, the 1% per capita gave more than 10 times the amount that the 99% per capita gave. So these are elections funded by this tiniest slice of the 1%. It's citizen funded, but it's citizen funded in a particularly unappealing way. So when I talk about citizen funded elections, I'm not talking about continuing this privately funded election system. But that leads some people to the opposite extreme, what they call government funded systems, like the Federal Election Commission system for funding presidential elections campaigns, which of course, Almost no candidate is using this year. There's one candidate using it, a guy named Buddy Romer, but nobody else is using it. And a system which is actually hated by most Americans. Most Americans look at it and they think it's kind of arbitrary. Some people are troubled because my money is being used to subsidize your speech. 
and it's bloated and bureaucratic, and it just doesn't have any of the appealing characteristics that we would want when we think of a system that represents democracy. So that's not what I mean by citizen funded election. But fortunately for me, you can see there's a space between these private and government solutions, and the space I'm going to say is a kind of system which we'll call representative funded system. So these are systems that opt into voluntarily small dollar funded campaigns. So candidates opt into them. They choose to fund their campaigns with small dollar contributions only, but the system then amplifies those contributions to make it possible for them to win their elections, never taking large contributions from anyone. Now, there are many particular versions of this. Three states right now, Arizona, Maine, and Connecticut, have a system like this. Connecticut's the most recent to adopt it. In the first year after Connecticut adopted this system, 78% of the elected representatives used this system to fund their winning campaigns, Democrats and Republicans alike, so that they never had to take any large contributions in, it in order to win in their districts in their campaigns. 2010, the House came very close to establishing or passing a bill that would achieve the same at the federal level. But these systems, I think, all suffer from a very important flaw from the perspective of conservatives. So I, in my book, Republic Laws, try to describe a little bit of a modification, a hacking of this on these systems that wouldn't suffer this flaw for the conservatives. So this is the way my system functions. I call it the Grant and Franklin Project. So here's how the Grant and Franklin Project works. You've got to first stipulate with me that every American, at least every voter, contributes, in quotes, at least $50 to our federal treasury, some through income tax, some through social security tax, some through payroll tax, some through cigarette tax, some through gasoline tax, whatever, at least $50 from each of us goes to the treasury. OK, so if $50 from each of us has gone to the, gone to the treasury, then the Grant and Franklin Project says, let's start by rebating the first $50 all of us send to the Treasury back to the voter in the form of a democracy voucher. They can then give that voucher to any candidate for Congress if that candidate agrees to fund his campaign with vouchers only and with contributions limited to $100 per person. So that's Grant, $50, Franklin, $100. Now, $50 per voter is $7 billion. 2010, the total amount raised for congressional elections was $1.8 billion. So this is three times the amount raised in 2010, meaning this is real money. But what distinguishes this system from the current system we have is that this is real money coming from all of us. It's representative not money coming from the tiniest slice of the 1%. So when I talk about citizen-funded elections, what I'm talking about is a representative way to fund elections so that the funders are the people. And when Congress is dependent upon the funders, it's just like de being dependent upon the people. So that, in my sense, is what citizen-funded campaigns means, small dollars, representative distribution. But what would that give us if we had such a system? If we had a system like the Grant and Franklin Project or any system where small dollar contributions constituted the only contributions inside a campaign, I submit that if we had such a system, then all of us could believe, as we all want to believe, that whenever Congress did something stupid, it might be because more Democrats were in Congress than Republicans or more Republicans than Democrats. But whatever the reason was, it was not because of the money because we had removed through this system the source of the cynicism that drives all of us to believe money is buying results in Congress. So it would give us a reason to trust, and it then might give us a reason to participate, and it might give us an opportunity then to restore the institution in a way that makes it so that we could once again have faith and have a reason to respect this core institution of our democracy. So that's the solution in the context of Congress. In the context of drugs, though, I think the problem is much harder. If citizen-funded campaigns are, in the scale of things, relatively cheap, citizen-funded drug research is not cheap. 60 to 
of the cost of clinical trials is now borne by pharmaceutical industry. We're not just going to get the government tomorrow to pay for that. So we have to think of ways to restore the trust in that context to the extent we believe there's a problem of trust that doesn't just imagine the magic bullet of government money solving the problem. In the context of rating agencies, I think the problem's relatively simple. It's better regulation. There's a million proposals out there now to make it so this obvious conflict of interest doesn't weaken their ability to do their job. But in the context of journalism, I don't think it's easy. We have this thing called the First Amendment. The First Amendment which says Congress may make no law which abridges the freedom of speech or of the press. And so any effort to muck about with the market for journalism faces a very strict Supreme Court limitation. But in the context of this problem, food, I think the solution here is fundamentally hard. Again, because most of us don't even recognize what the core problem is. And sometimes I wonder how much better off we would have been if the early libertarians, the early people on the right, who so got us to fear the march towards communism, instead had told the story in a way that got us to fear the march to Sugarland. If they instead told their story about the way government gets corrupted, but brought it home to the sort of issues that we think about and live every day at home, the issues about the stuff we eat. Because the story Hayek is telling about the way government gets captured and taken over by interest in a way that directs the end of freedom is also the story about how government gets captured and it gets directed towards the end of corrupting the ability of government to do anything sensible in the context of this core area of public policy. So the first step, I think, in solving this problem is pretty easy. It's to get these communists out of our system. It's to stop supporting those who openly embrace socialism as a way of running our government, at least when they're the beneficiaries of the socialism. Because when you begin to think about people like Dwayne Andreas, in every area of public policy that any of us care about, and you begin to connect the dots, not just food policy, but global warming policy, or health care policy, or tax policy, I think you begin to see the value of an insight offered to us about 150 years ago. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil. Henry David Thoreau, 1846, on Walden. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. And what the reflection on the Duane Andreases and the coal industry and the insurers and the pharmaceutical industry and the people who block tax reform should get us to recognize is that each of these problems has a common root. And if we can become strikers at that root the way Thoreau wanted us to, and to remove the corrupting influence of money from the system, we have a beginning of a chance to begin to fight that corruption and restore the trust in this government. OK, I have one more thought before we stop. One more, we could say, link. There it is, highlighted link that I would make between institutional corruption and an idea of responsibility. <clears throat> so I'm sure some of us, I can tell, some of us are too young to remember this, but at least some of us remember this picture, picture which came on March of 1989 when a, cap, a ship under the command of Captain Joseph Hazelwood ran aground and spilled about 11 million gallons into Prince William Sound, 11 million gallons of oil. Here's Captain Hazelwood after this accident calling the accident into the radio controllers. <laughs>
And uh, evidently, we're leaking some oil, and we're going to be here for a while. Now, I'm sure when you hear that, the question runs through your head. There's the same question that ran through the head of the people who saw the accident. They asked the question, was Captain Hazelwood intoxicated when he was captaining the supertanker? He said he wasn't. He said he'd only had four vodkas before he'd gotten on ship. His blood alcohol level said he must have been at least six times the legal limit when he got on board. But he and his lawyers fought that, and it was ultimately unresolved whether, in fact, he was intoxicated at the time of the accident, which produced, at that time, the worst environmental disaster in the history of the nation. So let's say there's some doubt about whether he was drunk. But what there was no doubt about was that he had a problem with alcohol. His mother said, testified he had a problem with alcohol. Exxon, in 1985, four years before the accident, treated him for his problem with alcohol. After the accident, the president said that he thought that he had mastered his problem. But in 1986, he had had his driver's license revoked for driving under the influence. And in 1988, the year before the accident, his license was revoked again for driving under the influence. At the time, he was captaining a supertanker. He was not legally allowed to be driving a VW Beetle. All right, now, forget again, though, Captain Hazelwood. What I want you to think about are those around Captain Hazelwood, the other officers around Captain Hazelwood, the people who could have picked up a phone. While a drunk was driving a super tanker, I want you to think about the people who did nothing. What do we think about them? Now, I ask that question in this way because I increasingly think, as I think about this range of issues, these range of institutions, our Congress most prominently, increasingly think that we are they. We face these critical problems requiring serious attention, but we have institutions incapable of that attention. They are distracted, these institutions, unable to focus, like pilots playing on their laptop instead of flying the plane, or surgeons flirting instead of focusing on their surgery, or half of us as we drive down the road with our cell phones in hand. We face these critical problems as a society requiring serious attention, but we have none of the institutions capable of giving that attention. And who is to blame for that? Who is responsible? It's too easy to focus on the evil people and hold them responsible. They are responsible for something, but they're not responsible for everything. Instead, we have to focus as well upon the good people, the decent people, the people who could have picked up a phone. We have to focus on us. We, the most privileged, are responsible for these corruptions. <laughs> And we, the most privileged, have the obligation to fix it. Because the most outrageous part is that these corruptions may have been primed by the most privileged, but they have been permitted by the passivity of the most privileged, too. Thank you very much. Can we take questions? Okay. So thank you very much, Professor Lessig. Um, we have two microphones here on the left and the right, so please come up um, and 